Ephesians chapter 5, once more, Ephesians 5, and we'll back up to verse 18 once again, Ephesians 5, 18, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18. And do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. And we'll read the rest of the verses as we come to them. Now, we contrasted the life of darkness versus light. For people that don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, verse 8 told us explicitly, you were darkness. That's what a person apart from the Lord Jesus Christ is. They're associated with darkness. They're not only walking in darkness or not only being assailed by the darkness, but their very character is darkness. But by contrast, but now you are light in the Lord. So this is the new nature we have in Christ that we've been brought from darkness to light. We now have this different nature. We're new creatures, children of light, as he calls us earlier in the chapter, back in verse 8. And we've been seeing some of the practical outworking, the practical sanctification, how to live a holy life that pleases God. And for people in the ancient world, much like people in the modern world, uh, being drunk with wine wasn't anything unusual. Uh, That was many people's chief hobby or main activity on the weekend or when they weren't working. And he says that they weren't to be doing that, but they were rather to be filled with the spirit. That's the wonderful thing. You know, when you go on a diet, you could say, well, I'm on a diet. I'm not going to eat chocolate and I'm not going to eat ice cream and I'm not going to eat linguine and all the things I love. And uh, now that Chris isn't here, I can say I'm not going to eat bread or something like that, you know, but you have to eat something. And if it's a sustainable diet, you need things you're going to like. You need to be able to eat things that you really enjoy or else you're not going to be able to maintain it. You can't just see seeding. And it's the same thing spiritually, that there's this putting away of the old things that had to do with our life before Christ, but the Lord brings new things to replace it. So being filled with the spirit, being under his control is far better than being drunk with wine, because when you're drunk with wine, you're out of control and the spirit In one sense, when we're filled with the Spirit, we are controlled by Him. But He never leads us to do anything that is going to embarrass us, that we're going to have cause to regret. Earlier in the chapter, He talks about the things that the people in darkness do in darkness. And He says it's a shame to speak of the things they do in secret. You'll never have to be ashamed of the things that the Lord by His Spirit leads you to do. Now, when you study in the Bible being filled with the Spirit, there's a lot of confusion because a lot of people confuse the baptism of the Spirit with the filling of the Spirit. The baptism of the Spirit is a historical happening. It happened on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. It's when God created the church. And every believer in Christ in this church age has been added to that church since then. We partake of that baptism that happened all those centuries later ago. But being filled, so there's one baptism we can say. One baptism, many fillings. To be filled with the Spirit is something that can happen more than once. In fact, it's something that is to be an ongoing thing. And when you see the believers in Acts, so often they were filled with the Spirit. And if you do a study of it, you find that it very often affected their speech. When someone was filled with the Spirit, they usually then opened their mouth and said something for the Lord. And this passage is no exception. It says, be filled with the Spirit, or be being filled with the Spirit. Verse 19, speaking. So he talks right away about their speech. Speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Now, it's interesting that we live in a time when music is so very important, right? And in the church, it's very important. Among Christians, there's a very big push on music. In fact, it's kind of, in the 21st century, displaced preaching as the central thing in the gathering of believers. Now, when believers get together, 
in a lot of churches, the preaching has been much shortened. I mean, when you think that the Puritans used to have sermons that were an hour to an hour and a half long, and nowadays there are places that say, you know, we ought to have a message that's 20 minutes or 30 minutes tops. Uh, you know, things have really diminished. And in the ancient world, Paul would preach very long on times till somebody fell out the window on one occasion in Troas in Acts chapter 20. I'm not advocating that per se, but I'm just saying it must have been a fairly long message there. And they were, they were not, uh, how shall I say, they were not uninterested in music, as this verse indicates. But you have to look at the emphasis that the New Testament puts on it. Over and over again, we read in the New Testament about the word of God, about reading the word of God, about preaching the word of God, about practicing the word of God. When you talk about music in the church, when you talk about singing, we have only a couple of verses in the New Testament. We have this verse in verse 19, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Keep your finger there. Go over to Colossians 3 a moment. Colossians 3, verse 16. Colossians 3, verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So a similar verse in both of these. They are to be maintaining the word of God through this singing and it's to be done to the Lord, both verses and to the Lord. Here in Colossians 3.16, it emphasizes for us the didactic purpose of singing or music. In other words, our singing is to teach us. Now that's very important. Teaching and admonishing. Teaching is the imparting of information, of course. Admonishing is telling us how we ought to live, what we ought to do. And, and so... The best of Christian hymnody, the best of Christian hymns and psalms and spiritual songs do that. It instructs us in the faith. It reinforces the word of God. And it tells us what we ought to do or how we ought to live. And when you think how the early church, and there was not universal literacy. Not everybody could read. Not everybody who could read had a copy of the scriptures. So they had to commit a lot of the scripture to memory. And what's a very easy way to memorize something? Well, put it to music. You know, almost anything you can remember if there's a little tune to it, right? That's how we remember so well, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. How do I remember that? Because I first learned A, B, C, D, you know, you know the song. Anyway, I first learned the song. Same with the books of the Bible. How in the world do you find where Habakkuk is? Well, you have to sing your way through it sometimes, right? Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, nay, oh, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, and so forth. You know, you got it. I'll get to Habakkuk eventually. But <clears throat> no more special music, I promise. I say this because even in the church's singing, biblically, the emphasis is on the word. Now, when we talk about Psalms, we're obviously talking about the Psalms of the Bible, that the Psalter was the church's hymn book. And many times we see either in prayer or apparently in singing the disciples and the early church using the book of Psalms. So the Lord Jesus, when he went out from the upper room, it says they sang a hymn. Now, what would they be singing at that time? Well, probably as observant Jews, they're singing the great Hallel. Psalm 113 through 118. So a lot of people think he's singing Psalm 118 as he goes out to go to the Garden of Gethsemane, which is, of course, going to lead to his arrest and his trials on the next day and his crucifixion. That's interesting because Psalm 118 is a messianic psalm. It says, among other things, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it, right? Or I will rejoice and be glad in it. The Lord was singing that. Even as he was coming to the day of his crucifixion. Imagine that. And it's also Psalm 118 that talks about the sacrifice being bound with cords to the horns of the altar. Something that didn't happen in the Levitical temple. Didn't happen in Solomon's temple or in that 
which stood in Jesus' day. But our Lord was going to be bound to the cross, wasn't he? They would pierce his hands and feet. And so even in what they sang, they're singing a psalm that pertained to what Messiah was going to do there. And uh, likewise, with the hymns and spiritual songs, you know, some Christians in church history have said, well, we ought only to sing the psalms. You know, that's the biblical thing to sing. But he doesn't just say the psalms here. He says in hymns and spiritual songs. So obviously there was room made for other people that have written down songs about the faith. Now, we have a wonderful heritage in English. We can go back more than a thousand years. For some of our hymns, we sing sometimes Jesus, the very thought of thee with sweetness fills my breast by Bernard of Clairvaux. And that, of course, is a hymn that goes back to the 11th century that goes back a thousand years. And there's some hymns that are even older than that. When you go to a country like Spain, uh, where I found out back when I was living there in the 90s, they have a much shorter history of hymns. Because they have a much shorter history with the gospel. That the gospel came to Spain outside of what evangelism was done in the first century by the apostles and their friends. There wasn't much gospel activity until the 1500s. And whenever the gospel was preached in Spain, it was vigorously persecuted. The Spanish Inquisition would push it down. And it was only in the 1800s that they started to see major church planning work being done as missionaries came in and evangelized and planted different churches of believers. And then they formed hymn books. And you go to their hymn books, they have some very nice hymns. And uh, a lot of them, though, you find out are translated from the English because they don't have that long heritage. Now, we shouldn't be proud because a lot of our English hymns are translated from German. You know, every time we sing something by Ernst Homburg, for example, That was originally written in German. Or when we sing, A mighty fortress is our God. That was originally, Ein feste Borg ist sehr Gott in German. So, you know, we've received from other languages as well. But we've got this great heritage of singing, of songs. And even with newer songs that are being written, some of them are very good. But whether it's an old song or a new song, you have to judge it based on the word. You have to say, is this song doctrinally sound? Now, some of them aren't. (laughs) There's a song today, these are the days of Elijah. I'm sorry, these are not the days of Elijah, okay? That song comes out of the signs and wonders movement because they're looking for miracles like Elijah the prophet did in the Old Testament. I'm sorry, they've misunderstood their dispensations completely. And they're singing about things that, have nothing to do with the church. It's got a very jaunty melody. So it's very popular, even in assembly youth groups we've encountered it in the camps. There are other songs that we've been to some camps and they've sung, and I can't even tell uh, what they're singing about. I mean, it used to be you'd have the 711 chorus, you know, seven words repeated 11 times, or was it 11 words repeated seven times? I don't know. But, you know, they'd take a scripture and you'd just sing that scripture over and over again. Well, at least it was in the Bible. That's all I can say for that. It's not the most edifying deep thing in the world. But nowadays with Hillsong and a lot of these other places, they're writing things And it could be a love song about anybody. It could be about your girlfriend. It could be about Buddha. It could be about Muhammad. You know, just they throw Jesus in there. But other than that, it's not especially scriptural. There's not biblical ideas. This is not what Paul's talking about here. When he's saying speaking to one another in Psalms, hymn and spiritual songs, there's a very important purpose here. As Colossians showed, of teaching one another and admonishing one another. In other words, reinforcing the faith and teaching doctrine. But here there's also the praise and worship aspect. Singing and making melody in your heart. Now notice this prepositional phrase. This is key. The end of verse 19. To the Lord. So when I sing a song, it does not matter if I think, oh man, this melody is really great. You know, or the harmony here is really tight. 
I love that music. Now, I like music. Anybody who knows me knows that I like classical, I like jazz, I like some old country. I mean, I like all kinds of music, right? If it's good, I, I, you know, according to me, obviously, I like it, okay? So I'm not anti-music. But the key thing here is, is this something that is really talking about the Lord? Is this something that's taken up with him? Because we want to be singing, making melody in our hearts to the Lord. That's the key thing. Now, I emphasize that because the model we see right around the world is to have a worship band that is up there and these people are having their great moment. I mean, everybody can be the Beatles now. You know, everybody can be their own pop star because they're up there on the stage and they are leading worship. Well, that model is foreign to the Bible. The worship leader is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit leads us to give out songs, to sing songs, and to sing those songs to the Lord. That's the key thing. So there are people that pick out their church by the kind of music and by the band and all of that. I've had a girl tell me my spiritual gift is bass playing. Now, I searched 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12 and Ephesians 4 and 1 Peter 4, the main passages on spiritual gifts. I did not find bass playing in it, okay? This was in California, just in case you're wondering. But, you know, she said this to me in all seriousness. Now, there's no doubt you can play a song on an instrument to the glory of God. I'm not disputing that. But we have to put it in place. The main thing is not the instrument. The instrument is to be a means of to help us to stay on tune or on key if we use an instrument or if we don't use an instrument. doesn't matter. The important thing is singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. It's got to be to the Lord. That's the key thing here. And it has to be biblical. It has to be rooted in Scripture. Now, it also, being filled with the Spirit, it involves our speaking. It involves our singing, obviously. In verse 20, it involves giving thanks. A Christian is someone who's thankful, thankful to God, right? A person who's not a Christian is unthankful. That's something that marks the last days, unthankfulness, according to 2 Timothy 3. And among the earliest sins in human history, Romans 1 says, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. So unthankfulness is very clearly a mark of not only ingratitude, but of being in the flesh or of being lost. And so uh, being thankful, conversely, is a mark of being filled with the Spirit. Giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then verse 21, a word that is not very popular. You know, every year the Oxford English Dictionary adds words to his dictionary and they always pick a word of the year well i'll tell you one that's not going to be picked as the word of the year anytime soon in our western culture submission that is not the idea people say don't tread on me have you noticed that flag has come back and that bumper sticker and i realize there are political reasons why people are doing that but here conversely he says verse 21 submitting to one another in the fear of god This is what Philippians 2 talks about. And we thought about it recently on Wednesday night. Not putting myself first. Not looking out for number one. Not looking for my advantages. But when I'm submitting to one another, I'm saying, well, what does this person need? What what do I have to do? How can I get low and serve them? This is the idea. Not that we come that we're the boss and we're in charge and everybody has to look to us or or they have to tailor the church to us. But we submit to one another, notice, in the fear of God. So we don't submit to one another because we deserve submission. I don't deserve you to respect me and want what's good for me. You don't deserve it from me in and of yourself. But because the Lord has made us and saved us, then we need to say, This person is the Lord's and I should submit to them where I can, where I can be faithful to God and serve that person and put them first. That's what I'm going to do. Now, this leads very practically into a very important relationship. 
And some people have made the statement, and I believe it to be true, that marriage is all about sanctification. Why has God invented marriage? Well, you say procreation, right? He wants to populate the earth. He told Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. Yes, that's right. That's part of it. But the actual relationship of marriage is meant to work on the husband and wife to make them more holy. Okay? Because we can think, if we're single, I, I know from experience, you think you've got it together. You think you're doing pretty well. And then you get married and you realize what a jerk you really are or how, how selfish you can be, you know? And this relationship, marriage, is meant mutually to sanctify the wives and the husbands. Now, it's going to be a picture of something bigger than that, as we'll see. Look at verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, that seems pretty tough, right? Wives, submit to your husbands. Now, a lot of times young people want to be countercultural, you know? And ever since the 60s, uh, back in the days when uh, my parents were young, their g- generation and even the one that came after them said, question authority. And when people say, submit, why should I submit? You know, I should stand up for my rights. Don't tread on me. Well, if you really want to be a rebel, if you really want to go against the grain of what other people are doing, you want to stand out, don't dye your hair purple. Everybody's doing that, okay? I mean, just go to Walmart. You'll see it all over the place. Don't get a tattoo. Everybody's doing that as well. Just go to the Boyertown pool. You'll see more ink than you want to, believe me. But you want to stand out. Practice biblical submission. Wives, Submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Wait a minute. (laughs) But you don't know what a rascal my husband can be. You don't know what a work in progress that guy really is. How many problems he's got. You know, the stupid things he says or some of the ways he behaves. Look at what it says there. As to the Lord. I mean, when the Lord tells us to do something. Do we stop and say, no, let's see, is the Lord deserving of us doing this? No, we say, of course the Lord's deserving. He's the Lord. He made us. He is sovereign. He's superior to us. But not only that, he redeemed us. He died for us. Of course we're going to submit to the Lord. So if the Lord tells us to do something, we'll do it. Well, the Lord tells wives, submit to your husbands. And this has been God's pattern from Genesis chapter 2 on up to the current day. Now, the Bible makes it evident that man and woman are not unequal. That man and women, as far as their intrinsic worth before God, are equal. Galatians 3 says that. Colossians 3 says that. Other passages of the word of God say that. The same blood that saves a man saves a woman. The same value and love that God puts on a man By giving his son to die for them, God puts on a woman. So it's not the sense of saying men are superior, men are more wise, men are smarter. In many cases, they're not, right? Individually, man to man and woman to woman. We can find husbands that are smarter than their wives. We can find wives that are smarter than their husbands. We can find, in some cases, wives that are physically stronger than their husbands or vice versa. And so it's not about that. It's not about equality. Because we find out that with the Lord, he takes the place of submission. When 1 Corinthians 11 talks about headship, it says that that God is the head of Christ. That the Lord Jesus, in other words, though he's co-equal with the Father, has taken the place of submission saying, Father, I will do your will. You will give the orders. I'll obey them. You'll tell me what to do. I'll follow it. So... Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Now, Christ being the head of the wife, what is the head? Well, someone who is the head of a corporation, 
They're in charge of that corporation, right? And we immediately begin to think of the perks. We say, oh, that's the guy with the big fancy car, right? That's the guy with the shiny corner office. That's the guy who gives all the commands and everybody has to hop to it and do what he says. Well, sorry, but Lee Iacocca hadn't been born yet when the New Testament was written. And God's idea of headship is a bit different than General Motors or any of the other corporations in our world today. When God talks about headship, yes, there's the responsibility of leading. Yes, there's the responsibility of making decisions and being a wisdom source. But it's like Christ is the head of the church. Now, notice what it says about Christ's headship in respect to the church. It says he is the savior of the body. Uh, F.F. Bruce translates it this way. He is the body's protector. That is what headship means. Yes, there's leadership. Yes, it involves making decisions. Yes, it involves saying this is what we're going to do sometimes, but not because I want to do what I want to do, not because I'm putting myself first, not because I'm going to be a dictator, but because I'm going to be a protector. I'm going to be a savior. That's God's object in marriage, that the husband is the protector of the wife. That he is going to take care of her, not only physically, because there are a lot of guys that figure, well, I go and I put in my 40, 50, 60 hours a week. I've done my responsibility. And, And then they check out. There's no more involvement. No, the husband's responsibility is making sure that wife is cared for. We're going to see more on that in a moment. But we have real high standards to live up to. We're the head of the wife, but it's like Christ being the head of the church. Now, can anyone complain about how the Lord is leading the church? Well, we have no just cause to complain, do we? (laughs) The Lord is leading the church in the wisest, greatest possible way. And if we only submit to him, we find the best possible way of doing things and the best life we could ever have. Therefore, verse 24 says, Just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, again, the Bible sometimes makes these carpet uh, blank statements or or whatever we want to call that, like be subject in everything. Obviously, there are certain exceptions, like we're not talking about sin. So a husband cannot command his wife to join him in sin and expect his wife to submit to that. That would be, um, we have to honor God rather than man is the principle. Verse 25, husbands love your wives. So yes, we're to be the head and the wives are to submit, but husbands are to love our wives. Now he uses that word uh, from the agape word group. Okay, so we're talking about the same kind of love that God has showed toward humankind. Husbands love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Verse 25. Now, if you, you basically have premarital counseling in one verse, in chapter 5, verse 25, that if you only needed to be told one sentence about what God's idea is for marriage, uh, at least from the man's perspective, what should a husband be? He should love his wife like Christ loved the church. How did Christ show his love for the church? He gave himself for her. What does he mean he gave himself for her? What does that mean? That meant he left his father's throne above, so free, so infinite in his grace, said Wesley, emptied himself in matchless love and bled for Adam's helpless race. That meant he left heaven, came to earth and became a man, lived in obscurity for nearly 33 years, and suffered all kinds of persecution and reproach from humankind, eventually died on the cross, That's how he got the church. He purchased her with blood of his own, Acts 20 says. So the Lord paid for the church as much as he could possibly pay. We say, we hear athletes say all the time, I gave 110%. I don't get that mathematically, but that's what they say. I left it all on the court. I left it all on the field, right? Well, only the Lord Jesus could really say this. He gave himself for her. There was not one selfish atom in the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. There was not one thing about himself where he put himself first. Romans 15 says, he pleased not himself. 
Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. So I'm married. I'm the boss. I'm the head of my home. What does that mean? That means I better be sacrificially giving myself for my wife. I better be sacrificially giving myself for my family. That I shall love the same way the Lord Jesus did. Not by pleasing myself, not by putting myself first, but by putting others first and giving for them even when it's costly. Happy Father's Day, okay? It's not all about the presents and the cards we get and the nice lunches, as good as those things are. And believe me, it is biblical to honor father and mother. But we are to give ourselves. Now, look at why the Lord did this, verse 26. That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. This is in keeping with the whole thrust of chapter 5 of Ephesians. It's all about sanctification. It's all about becoming the holy people of God. And how was God to make us holy? I mean, we were darkness. How was God to make us light? Well, the Lord Jesus had to give himself to die on the cross and save us. He had to rise again from the dead and give us the gift of eternal life. But now what does he use to sanctify us? Well, the Lord Jesus himself prayed in John 17, 17, sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. He wanted them to be set apart as his people. Positionally, they're set apart. He calls them saints, set apart ones, holy ones. These are my people. And he wants them to live sanctified. He wants them to live a holy life. That's what that means. That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. Now, we, before we knew Christ, we were very dirty in sin, spiritually speaking. No matter how much we might have thought we were clean, Isaiah says we are all as an unclean thing and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Here we had to be cleaned by the word of God. And that's still the way God cleans us. When you read the scripture, that scripture cleanses you. That scripture shines the light into your mind and your life. And you start to say to yourself, you know, some of the ways I've been thinking are wrong. I used to think this was the normal way to think. But now I see this is the fruit of sin. Or some of the things I say, they're wrong. I shouldn't say them. I should speak more like my Lord. Or some of these things, you know, that I should be doing that I'm not doing, I ought to do and so forth. He cleanses us or cleanses her, speaking of the church, with the washing of the water of the word. Why? Verse 27, that he might present her to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Now, how would you like to have to get your wife ready for your wedding day? You go out and you pick a person living on the street, a person that doesn't have access to good bathing facilities, a person that doesn't have access to clean clothes, doesn't have access to all the things that many of us take for granted. Poor people. It's a terrible shame that people live like this in our world. And thanks be to God, there are a lot of ministries, a lot of believers reaching out to such people. But imagine you go and pick one of those women off the street and you see this filthy person And you take her and you have to bathe her. You have to wash her all over and you have to adorn her and you have to put on the perfume and you have to fix her hair and make sure there's not knots in it. You have to braid it or something, you know, and you make her glorious, not having a spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she should be holy and without blemish. You know what that means, young people? No zits, you know, no warts. No blemish whatsoever. You look at this person and they're beautiful. Now think about it. The Lord Jesus, who is altogether lovely. That's what the Song of Songs says about him. The Lord Jesus, who's altogether lovely, wants his people to be altogether lovely as well. He wants to present us to himself so that when he comes to receive us, because that's how they did it in Bible times at a wedding. The bride didn't come down the aisle with the husband, the groom, standing at the front waiting for her like we do in our culture. The groom went to the bride's house and collected her and took her into the wedding feast. And that's what the Lord's going to do. He's going to come for his church and he presents the church to himself and she's adorned. What is she adorned with? Well, Revelation 19 says, John said, I saw the bride descending from heaven and she was arrayed 
with fine linen. The fine linen is the righteousnesses of the saints or the righteous acts of the saints. In other words, as the Lord works in us and produces what we were talking about earlier in the chapter in the last message, the fruit of the spirit, as he produces in us good works, you know what we're doing? We're sowing another part of the wedding garment of the church. Now think about that. You ever see a, a gown that somebody has handmade? I mean, my wife got married in a handmade garment, but imagine if we could get a garment that was made by craftsmen from all over the world, from different materials. If some master textile artisan could take material from Malaysia and India and Afghanistan and um, Germany and Albania and France and England and the United States and Canada and you name it, you know, South America, all these different places. If you could take some material and yet bring it together that it's a composite whole and it doesn't look like a, some kind of weird patchwork, but it's this beautiful garment. That's what the bride of Christ is going to look like on that wedding day. He's going to present it to himself wholly and without blemish. So he says, verse 28, so husbands ought to love their own wives. Now notice this, as their own bodies. So as if it wasn't enough to say we ought to love our wives as Christ loved the church. That's pretty high standard, isn't it? We ought to love our own wives the same way we love our own body. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. Now, very early on in my life, I learned that, you know, it's important for me to eat. In fact, I, I can't remember learning it. I think I kind of knew it intuitively. The Lord hardwired that into me as a little baby. But through my life, I've become quite adept at getting what I need food-wise. And what's more than that, anyone who's been camping with me knows that I have a rule. We will not camp where there is no capacity to take a shower. Because if I'm going to be out in the wilderness roughing it and dealing with bugs and being threatened by bears and who knows what else, I'm at least going to be clean. If I'm going to die, it's going to be hygienically, okay? So, you know, I need to have my herbal essences or whatever. I don't really use that. But anyway, I'm going to have to have my shower every day if I'm going to be a happy camper, if you'll pardon the expression. I need those creature comforts. And, you know, that's how we are, even as men. Oh, I need my coffee, or I need my tea, or I need my food, or I need to shower, or I need to do something for my body that feels good. Well, the same way we take care of our body, and I don't get up in the morning and say, oh, do I have to give my body breakfast again? You know, I mean, and when I say get my body breakfast, I mean ask Naomi for it. But do I have to get my body breakfast again? Do I have to comb my hair again? Do I have to take a shower again? No, I'm like, this is what makes my body feel good. You know, this is what is all about taking care of me. And I don't give it a second thought. Now, that's how the husband and wife relationship is to be. For the husband loving his wife, it's like loving himself. Because really, we're part of a tremendous unity. Verse 30, for we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. And then he quotes Genesis 2. Verse 31 says, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Now, what is marriage in its essence? It is not just two buddies getting together, you know, to kind of share the rent. It's not a couple of roommates living together under the same roof. It's not people sharing the domestic chores. It's not even people for the greater good of the human species trying to procreate and bring children into the world. Marriage is to be the formation of a union that is so close that two become one. That Two things that were separate and independent are now brought together in the tightest of unity and they act in concert with one another. It's beautiful to see, you know, you can't see it so well at year one of your marriage. You can't see it at year five. You can't even see it so well, I don't think, at year 16. I see it in people at year 40, at year 50, in some people, by the grace of God, year 60 or beyond. You see these married couples and they're devoted to one another. 
And some are here today, okay? I don't want to embarrass anybody, so I'm not calling out any names. It's not that they're perfect. I'm not overly romanticizing this. It's not that they agree on everything. It's not that they completely understand one another all of the time, okay? That's not reality. But it is that they're together in a union where they're committed and they're loyal. And they say, whatever happens, we're together. And I think it's probably some kind of secular song. But my dad used to like this song that the Irish tenors sang. They used to do concerts on PBS and we'd enjoy watching the Irish tenors. And the one Irish tenor, Dylan McDermott from Canada, ironically, he was of Irish heritage, but he's a Canadian. But he used to sing this song. Life is an ocean and love is the boat. In troubled waters, it keeps us afloat. And in a very clever way, this song took all this nautical imagery, all this maritime stuff of sailors and captains and the captain and the first mate or the husband and wife. And the children are the crew. And he goes through and he talks about life. And you're like, yeah, this really isn't a bad metaphor to describe what it's all about. Because you all, we use that expression, don't we? We're all in the same boat, right? And if you're in the same ship, you have a vested interest in seeing that ship prosper. You all want to see it get to its appointed end. Well, God invented this concept back in Genesis 2. The two shall be made one flesh. And then he blows our minds in verse 32. I'm not just talking about marriage. Paul says he's not just talking about marriage. This is a great mystery. Not like Hercule Poirot where you need your little gray cells to figure out the mystery. No, a mystery being a truth that wasn't previously revealed but now has been revealed. This is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. What? You mean when you talk about someone being unified with someone else. When you talk about an independent person joining himself to someone else in love. And saying I'm committed to you and I want to live for you. I want to serve you. I want to pour myself out for you. I can't live without you. I will die so that I may have you. And I will rise again and share my life with you that I might take you to glory. And like me, you might be without spot or blemish or any such thing. Yes, that's what Christ has done for the church. We're not independent of him. We are united to him with the closest bonds possible. The hymn writer said, so near, so very near to God, I cannot near be. For in the person of his son, I am as near as he. So dear, so very dear to God. I cannot dear be the love wherewith he loves his son. Such is his love for me. Nevertheless, verse 33, let each one of you in particular. So love his own wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So the world kind of puts into it that you come in as equal partners. And if you don't like it, if things aren't going your way, you leave. That's not what God says. God says the woman submits to the husband. Well, how can I do that? Would he not take advantage of me? If I put him first and let him make the decision to let him lead, is he going to wreck my life? Well, you're doing this as unto the Lord and hopefully you're marrying in the Lord. That's what you're to do. According to first Corinthians seven, you're to marry a person that loves the Lord Jesus who's subject to him. So if you're submitting to him, the Lord's going to work on that husband to do what? To love you like Christ loved the church. Do any of us husbands do that? Well, we can't match the Lord. I'll tell you that up front. So we need a lot of grace. We need a lot of forgiveness. We need a lot of mercy from our wives. But nonetheless, that's the standard we're called to. And by the grace of God, the spirit of God can work in us to bring that kind of unity as we love our wives with Christ-like love and as they submit to us with church-like respect. Father, we're thankful For the Lord Jesus Christ, what a picture he is for us, our perfect lover, our great husband, our Lord, and uh, we are so grateful for him. We're thankful to be united to him. For anyone who's single, Father, thou art a special blessing to them. They've been given a gift, 1 Corinthians 7, 7 says. So we know they don't lack either. The Lord is to them everything they need him to be. But Father, for those of us who are married, we pray that we would emulate our Lord in this. We'd imitate him 
and we would love our wives as Christ loved the church and that the wives would submit to their husbands. We pray this for the glory of God and for the good of thy people. In the Lord Jesus' holy name, amen.